In Land of Promise, I look at the interaction between uh, what I argue are three waves of technological innovation, three industrial revolutions, and three American republics, uh, that is, different regimes uh, from the founding of the United States in the 18th century up to the present. Uh, the, the French are famous for having formal revolutions which result in new formal constitutions. They're now in their fifth republic. Uh, they've been through uh, several empires, a consulate, a directory, uh, and uh, a couple of monarchies since uh, their revolution in 1789. We Americans pretend that we just had one revolution one time, uh, the War of Independence against the British, and since the adoption of the federal constitution in, in 1787-88, uh, we've had continuity of government. Uh, most political scientists and historians, though, argue that you can talk about different regimes or, or different republics. There are long periods of stability, uh, and then sudden uh, bursts of reform, usually during crises, like the American War of Independence and its aftermath, the Civil War and Reconstruction, and the Depression and the New Deal and, and World War II. Uh, so I, I follow uh, others like Bruce Ackerman, uh, who have argued that there have been three republics uh, in the United States. A first republic uh, lasting from the founding period, uh, it falls apart uh, during the Civil War and is rebuilt by Lincoln and his successors and that second republic then lasts until the Great Depression and it disintegrates and Franklin Roosevelt and his descendants uh, or his, his political successors including uh, modern Republicans like Eisenhower and Nixon uh, then construct this third republic. Uh, history will show whether the Great Recession is the end of the Third Republic and the beginning of what I hope is a Fourth Republic. I hope it's not a, a first principate or a first empire or something like that of the United States. Uh, but the question that I wanted to address in Land of Promise was what are the, the interactions between these cycles of political change and the cycles of technological change, uh, which a lot of historians agree have been three in, in the economy. Uh, the first industrial revolution based on steam power, the second industrial revolution which really got going in the 1860s and 1870s around the time of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Uh, that was based on the invention of the internal combustion engine and the uh, commercialization and adoption of electricity and electrical motors. And finally you have the third industrial revolution based on computers and microelectronics along with nuclear power, jet engines, and satellites and uh, space travel, uh, which really get going in the 1940s, but don't begin to transform ordinary daily life until the 1980s and 1990s. And the explanation I came up with in Land of Promise is that American political institutions are always solving the problem of the previous industrial revolution. So there's a time lag. Uh, you get this new wave of technology that starts transforming the economy the way steam engines did. Uh, so you, you initially have the steam engine, nobody can figure out what to do with it. Then you can put it on a ship and you have a steamboat. You put it on a wagon and you have a railroad. Uh, it creates enormous markets. The enormous markets create big businesses. Uh, it, it just outgrows the original small local scale of American government and it creates problems which build up until there's a crisis. Uh, in this case, the political crisis of the Civil War, uh, which is indirectly related to the transformation of the North and the South by industrialization in the North and by uh, the growth of cotton agriculture in the South as part of the, what was actually the British imperial economy of which the American South was the major supplier of cotton uh, to the British uh, textile industry. Uh, so Lincoln comes to power. The Lincoln Republicans create national banking. They have national infrastructure on a scale worthy of the steam era. Uh, the transcontinental railroads, uh, the telegraphy, all of this. The, you know, they, they create the, not only the institutional, but the physical framework for a steam era industrial republic. And at the very moment that the ink is drying in Congress on the banking acts and, and the uh, transcontinental railroad acts, uh, in laboratories, most of them in Germany and France and in Britain at the time, but also the United States, uh, Edison, uh, for example, uh, in engineers and scientists are creating the next wave of technology which will render Lincoln's Republic obsolete in a couple of generations and I argue in Land of Promise that that is indeed what happened once you had this new wave of technologies began reshaping uh, the economy and society automobiles, uh, electrical grids, uh, uh, automated increasingly mechanized factories uh, at that point 
the arrangements of the 1860s and 1870s, the last period of reinvention, uh, had worked very well. They were great improvement over the previous, by that time, anachronistic institutions. But now they were obsolete and they were colliding with these emerging uh, patterns in the economy and society. And one of the things that was done by Roosevelt and his successors, Democrats and Republicans, and their equivalents in Western Europe and post-war Japan, uh, was to come up with a, a new system, a new regime. Uh, it was literally a new government in some of the conquered Axis countries. Uh, here it was, it was based on policies and reinterpretations of statutes. Uh, but the Third Republic, was a successful adaptation of uh, American institutions, legal and political, uh, to the new society that had, had been created in part. I don't want to be too economic deterministic here, but, but uh, uh, that is the foundation of, of a lot of the uh, social change. Uh, it's these new grids, the, the road grid and the electricity grid, that creates a new suburban society, uh, increasingly service sector occupations, uh, and uh, if you look at the 1950s and the 1960s, the golden era of capitalism on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, you got what was, was, would be called a, a social contract, a consensus, a balance of power among business, labor, and government in which everybody shared the prosperity uh, that had been made possible in part uh, by these new technologies, uh, the automobile and electricity and electrical motors. Uh, what's happened since the 1970s, I argue, in Land of Promise, is that we've had the beginnings of a new technological revolution uh, based largely on information technology, IT. Uh, but the institutions that we have are holdovers from the middle of the 20th century, and even though they worked very well then, uh, they're increasingly out of step with a society which is not only uh, a, a society in which nearly 90% of people work in the service sector, not in manufacturing anymore, but also increasingly the service sector jobs are low wage, uh, human contact, uh, high touch rather than high tech jobs in, uh, if you think about retail, fast food, uh, and the ones that are expanding the most rapidly of course have to do with an aging and increasingly sick population. Uh, nursing aids, for example, home health aids. Uh, the, the institutional systems that we had to upgrade industrial labor like labor unions uh, in, in Detroit uh, are irrelevant uh, in, in their, their mid-1950s, 1960s forms uh, to this new emerging service sector workforce of the 20th, 21st century. So one of the challenges is uh, to literally rebuild America's uh, physical structure. It's not just metaphor, it's, it's actually physical. Uh, uh, in order to, wh whether it's uh, fiber optic pipes, natural gas pipelines, uh, mobilizing the new technologies uh, in the interest of greater prosperity, but also uh, metaphorically changing the landscape of American law and politics uh, to ensure that everyone can benefit from this so that the gains from economic growth are not funneled uh, to fewer and fewer people.